we'd like to welcome defending champion of the Waste Management Phoenix Open Web. Web, thanks for joining us for a few minutes. Obviously, a, a place you're fun to come back to. You're making your 11th start in addition to the win last year. You got a second, and in addition to those two, three additional top 10 finishes. So, obviously, a place special to you. Just some thoughts on being back here this week. Yeah, it feels great to be back. Uh, I was just walking in the clubhouse, and it's crazy to me how fast time goes out here on the tour that it's been a year since I was here last Sunday or last year on Sunday. Um, but I always love playing golf in the desert. Um, this golf course has always been fun for me to play. I enjoy competing on it. And uh, it's very different this year. You know, just walking around, not seeing grandstands, being able to see the 18th hole from the parking lot. Um, a lot of things will be different this year, but it still feels good to be back. And um, I look forward to trying to de defend my title. Uh, so far this season, you're off to a great start. Three top tens and seven starts, including a, a top five in Sony in your most recent start. If you could just kind of assess the state of your game heading into the week. Yeah, this year, um, you know, it's been an interesting year getting the coronavirus at the end of December. You know, showing up at, at Century the Wednesday before. Um, we, we haven't had the best winter in Charlotte, so it's been tough to really work on my game a lot. But... Um, saw some some good things at the Sony, like you mentioned. Um, Paul gave me a putting tip at uh, Century after the first round, and I started putting a lot better the final three rounds and putted great at Sony. Um, so I, I would say the, the one area that hasn't been as sharp is my approach to the greens, uh, but I've worked on a few things in the last couple of weeks that I feel like are going to serve me this week, and um, I just feel good. I feel I feel like I'm approaching the game right now with a simple mindset, and um, we kind of have a game plan on this golf course. And so I'm excited where the game is um, and looking forward to, you know, I got a lot of work to do, I think, the next two days to get ready, but I'll be ready. Okay, I've got one more question for you, and then we'll open it up to questions from a few people online. One of the uh, always a fun talking point is the 17th tall here. If you could just kind of take us through your mindset on the deciding factors of how you how you play that hole. On 17? Yeah. Yeah, so we'll obviously always go for the green. Um, I have to have it downwind for me to carry that cross bunker, you know, 40 yards short or so. Um, but, you know, the only pin that really requires a good amount of conversation is the back left because you know we can hit a great drive at the center right center of the green and go too far and then you have no shot so that's really the only pin that requires much of a conversation the other pins front left front right back right we're going kind of right center of the green every day um, okay. sometimes I'll hit it higher to soften it out sometimes I'll hit it lower to try to scoot it it kind of depends on the wind kind of depends on how firm the golf course is uh, during that round but again back left is the one you give, you give me a four right now, I'll take it and, and not play it. Okay, all right, perfect. Well, with that, we'll open it up and take a few questions, and we'll start with Todd Kelly from the Arizona Republic. Todd, if you take yourself off mute, and if you'd like to put yourself on video, feel free to do that. All right, let's try the video and see if I can do that. Hey there, Webb, thanks for joining us. I had a question about the fans. It's kind of a two-part question. There will be a limited number of fans. This will be the first time in a while you've played in front of fans. So I was wondering what your thoughts about finally hearing some reaction to some of your shots once again. But on the flip side, it's nowhere near what it normally is. So how different is this tournament going to play without just the throngs of people everywhere? Yeah, uh, I definitely miss the fans. You know, you make a 20-footer, you want to hear, you know, people clap, get excited, or chip in, or whatever it might be. And um, I think playing out here for a while, you start to you realize kind of how Tiger and Phil and these guys really use the crowd to their advantage. You know, whether you're one over and you need some momentum, making a 20-footer for birdie and, and feeling that energy from the crowd can sometimes get you going when you kind of are flat. Um, and, I mean, the environment Tony and I played in last year on Sunday, just the playoff, the, the even the final round uh, with Hudson, it, it's so fun to be in that energy and – to hear the noises and all day you're hearing roars on 16 or boos. Um, so that, that will definitely be missed this year, maybe more than any other golf course we play. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's, it's one of these years where I feel like we're going to go through it and we're going to realize what we're missing. And so we're going to hopefully be back to normal next year, um, I hope, because this tournament is kind of in a league of its own when it comes to 
the energy and the loudness and uh, it's fun to feel that kind of nervous energy, you know, walking through the tunnel on 15 and and knowing you're about to enter into an environment that we'll never have again for the rest of the year. So it'll definitely be missed, um, but maybe a little stress-free this year compared to every other year. All right, great, thanks. Okay, we're going to add Adam Shupak. Adam. Hey, Wad Bob. I'm just curious, what's the best thing you ever heard at the 16th hole, either about yourself or somebody else? I can't remember specifics, Adam, but I love when they go after the caddies and they start saying specific things about the caddies and their life or their home or their childhood, whatever it might be. Um, it's kind of like, you know, the, the, the students at Duke University in the basketball games, they come up with stuff that you wonder how they could. Um, and it, it just provides some humor. You know, you want to enjoy that moment. I remember my first couple of years here, I would be so nervous. I just want to get through it and get to 17. But then I just got to the point where I kind of laughed and enjoyed it, looked around. Um, you know, those people, they're, they're funny and they come up with some great stuff. So I wish I had a specific one for you, but um, just when, when they go after the caddies, I always enjoy it. And then second question, you're, since you left here with the trophy last year, where are you trying to gain some uh, improvements in your, in your some specific improvements in your game, and did you visit with Butch on your way out here, like you have in the past? No, I wasn't able to visit with Butch. I had to get out here a little earlier. Um, but I would say the the one area I feel like we kind of keep coming back to for me is kind of the straightforward chips and pitch shots that I've really been working hard on. Kind of the specialty shots around the green I've been pretty good with, um, and then kind of shots out of the rough. I'm. You know, typically I drive it fairly straight, so I don't get a ton of work out of the rough. And even at Sony, it cost me a couple shots of just kind of guessing about the lie or, um, you know, the ball coming off a little right when I thought it was going to come off a little left. So I would say those two areas are the ones that I feel like if I can improve there, it'll take me just up a notch a little bit in my ability to kind of be more consistent. Um, so hopefully we got a little rough this week. I can work on it next couple of days. But, um, yeah, I mean – I'm always kind of eyeing those areas, and if I keep coming back to them, it shows like I, I need to improve there. Thank you. Yep. Okay, Webb, we go now to Josh Weinfuss with ESPN here in Phoenix. Josh? Hey, Webb. Um, 16 in particular, how do you think it's going to play without 22,000 drunk fans? I think guys will play it very simple. I mean, I don't think you'll see much difference in scores. Um, you know, I think PGA Tour players have this weird way about them that the, the tougher and more chaotic an environment, the more they focus and they hit good shots. Um, there's been some amazing shots over the years there. So uh, I don't think it will affect the scores really at all. I just think the overall energy on 15, 16, 17 with the lack of fans there is going to be different and kind of a letdown. But um, – you know, still, I, it looks like it's built out. I haven't been out there, but it looks like it's built out a good amount. So hopefully they'll get as many as they can in there. Yeah, it's one layer instead of one Okay. Level. Okay, Three. yeah. You, without having 150,000 people on the course, does that change anything about the, your approach where you can, you're not hearing 16 on the other side of the course, anything like that? Not really. I mean, this tournament – at the end of the week, we always feel like we just played a major because we're so tired from – you have to zone out a lot of times throughout the round. You have to focus, you know, extra hard on getting ready for a shot because there's just a lot of noise. Um, so I, I think, you know, I'm not going to play the course any differently, but I definitely think I'll be able to conserve energy a lot more knowing that, you know, a normal year on the fourth or fifth hole, I might have somebody yelling in my backswing. So probably won't have as much as that uh, of that this year. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Webb, well, we'll go to your part of the country, go to Ron Green Jr. Ron. What's up, hey, Ron? Hey, bud. You'll be glad to know the weather's no better here. Uh, <laughs> today, the USGA and RNA released some proposal for guarding distance down the road, uh, maybe limiting driver shaft lengths, maybe some ball testing things. Just wondering where you stand on the whole distance debate and also. How big a player should the PGA Tour be in this whole discussion? 
Yeah, it's a great question, Ron. Um, my first problem I have with the driver length is if, if a six foot 10 really good golfer comes out, like, are we really going to tell him he can't use anything longer than 46? Um, so that's my only problem with the length of the driver. But I've been kind of saying for the last few years, I, I don't think equipment's the problem. I do think, you know, Jack Nicklaus hit it a lot further than Bobby Jones. And then the guys after Jack are going to hit it further than Jack. And distance was never really that big of an issue when Jack was playing and hitting it 300 yards. Um, I just think the, the issue comes down to golf course architecture. We need more dog legs. We need tighter fairways. We need longer rough. We need smaller greens. We need f more firm greens. All those things I just named saves money, saves water, saves land that you have to build a golf course. We know that 8,000 yard golf courses are not the answer. Brooks Kepka shot 16 under at Aaron Hills. I, I believe that's what he shot. That's link, lengthening courses is not the issue. Bunker placements, dog legs, tree placements. I even think at Augusta on 13, Ron, we don't need that T40 yards back. What they need is a mid-sized tree, 20 yards in front of the tee box, and five feet left of the tee box. Because the issue right now is guys can tee it up on the right and they hit a high, they can even cut it, some of these guys, over the tree. Well, if you put a tree there, guys can't do that. And it's just like the fourth hole this year at Wingfoot. It's a dogleg left par four, uh, but there's a tree there with branches, so the bombers can't hit their cut over that bunker, so a lot of the bombers just hit three wood. So I, I really think the attention does not need to be on equipment or the golf ball. Billy Horschel had a great comment a couple of years ago. He said, the golf ball is not an issue. I hit a seven iron in college, 180, uh, 180 yards, and now I hit it 180 yards. So it's, it can't really be the golf ball is the, the problem. Now the driver, the face is a lot thinner, they're bigger. I, I understand that. But I don't think a, an equipment rollback does anybody any good when, when we can change the way golf courses are designed, and it's better for amateurs, it's better for pros. Um, and there are plenty of golf courses on the PGA Tour that have stood the test of time because of the way they're designed. Um, equipment advances don't really pay off or pay a dividend on those courses. And I, and I just feel like these tweaks we could make are, are really not that hard and they're cost effective. So. Your last point about the PGA Tour, uh, I think their voice should be very loud. I respect the USGA and RNA a great deal, and I know that their intentions are great, but I don't think an equipment rollback is what we need. I think we need different, I, I think we need to tweak our golf courses. Thanks very much, appreciate it. Yep. All right, we got another one. Steve Demeglio with USA Today. Steve. Well, be just a couple of them. Do you have any lingering effects from COVID-19? And if you don't, what was the first thing you ate that you were able to taste? And how <laughs> My taste is like 75% back. That was definitely a lot worse than I anticipated, not being able to taste food. Smell was fine. Uh, but... My taste came back like it's slowly coming back, so it didn't like all of a sudden come back. But I'm a coffee guy, and I just missed being able to smell and taste my coffee in the morning. So now that it's coming back, I have a greater appreciation for it. And the other thing, we've talked about how different it's going to sound there this week. Without the grandstand, without fans lining the holes, are there places you can be more aggressive or less aggressive? Are sight lines going to be changed for you drastically? Uh, would there be any difference because of that? Yeah, I think there's certain holes where tee shots with a big crowd, at, having a big crowd there actually help. Like I think of 11, there's tons of people down the right side and guys typically will miss it right there. And the crowd would, you know, stop it from going in the, in the desert. I think things like that, I don't think my sight lines will change much or where I'm aiming, but I think that might be the biggest thing is the crowd stopping balls. Cause once it gets in these deserts, like left on five, um, right on three it, the ball just keeps going and so now we're not going to have as many people and so you might see more of that thank you sir yep okay looks like we've got two more coming your way Webb. we'll go back to adam shupak adam webb just a follow-up on what you were saying to ron green there do you think the pga tour is playing at the wrong at some of the wrong venues right now do they need to does the pga tour need to change where it plays That's a great question. Um, I just think the PGA Tour 
needs to take a harder look as well about where we're going in the game. And you take a golf course. A perfect example. Number 10 at Quail Hollow, my home club. The bunker is 300 yards to carry it. Well, if you can carry it 300 yards, which I would say roughly 30 to 35 guys on the PGA Tour now can carry that far, their fairway is roughly twice the size of a guy who can't carry it 300. My idea was, hey, flip the bunker, just flip it. And now the amateurs, they have a wider fairway. Shorter hitters have a wider fairway. The bombers can still hit driver, but now it's 330 to carry. Nobody's carrying that bunker. And you've made the hole harder for the more advantaged guy who hits it forever, um, but it's still in his court to hit driver if he wants to. And you've made it easier for the amateur. And so that little tweak, I think, is where these, some of these TPCs of the PJ Tour could say, hey, we're going to make this harder, but we're not going to add length. We don't need length. We need more bunkers. Um, we need more trees, like I said. So I think it's almost more of the major championships, where they're going. They want to make them hard. We'll make them hard, you know, by, by doing the things that I've said with, with trees and bunkers. And, you know, guys on 14 at Augusta, another thing, they're hitting cuts there. It's a dog leg left. Guys 30 years ago would have said, what do you mean they're hitting cuts? Well, they're hitting cuts over the tree. Well, they can't hit a cut over the tree if you plant a couple pine trees, which they're, Augusta's so good at doing. You know, 17's got, seems like, 30 more trees than it did 10 years ago on both sides of the fairway. But on 14, again, you plant a couple of pine trees up the left, 30, 40 yards off the tee, guys can't hit cuts. They're forced to try to turn it right to left. Um, and with modern day equipment, it's harder to turn uh, drivers right to left. So they'll probably hit three wood. So I think there needs to be more of that kind of outside the box thinking than simply let's make courses longer and limit the distance. Um, the Dustin Johnsons and the Bryson DeChambeau's of the PGA Tour with limited equipment are still gonna be the bombers, you know, if this happens. And I think we'll have the same problems. Um, guys are, we're very adaptive out here. We're gonna figure it out. And I think they'll have the same issue again in 20 years. Um, and the last thing I'll say is, I love the fact that bombers sell tickets and I think they do. Guys, little kids don't wanna come watch me hit a driver off the, they wanna see Bryson DeChambeau and Dustin Johnson. And I think that's good for the game as long as these courses can kind of go along with that you know, with the distance changes. Okay. And there's uh, been talk about you with the leader in strokes game attitude. Is there something in Justin Thomas that you really admire, something other than just how far he hits it or being a great iron player? Yeah, I mean, I've played with him. I feel like every time I've played with him, he, he he's had like a 62 or 3. Um, I love watching him play when he gets going. I feel like he actually gets more comfortable and more excited to play when he's seven, eight under. There's like a hyper focus, and I, I saw that you know in Tiger over the years. Um, and so he's a he's a really fun guy to go out with, especially when he's playing well. He just, like I said, the better he plays, the the kind of more into it I feel like he gets. Thank you. Okay, we will go to Mark McClure with CBS Five, and then finish up with Todd Kelly. Mark. Hold on one second, guys. Sorry about that. Anyway, thanks for the time today. You got hey, it. Uh, just wanted to wanted to know if you could maybe take me through the range of emotions last year and just uh, the, the way things ended here, Super Bowl Sunday, the momentum you got from that, and then having to shut it down a couple weeks later. Maybe uh, you know plans for the year, plans changed. Um, what well, you went through in December, and then being back here, how did how did you process that whole thing? Well, you know, when I hit it in the water on 15 on Sunday and Tony hit it down the middle, I was already one back. Um, I, I didn't think it's over, but I thought, man, you know, I got a lot of work to do, especially if he makes birdie here. And he made par and I made bogey and I'm two back and then all of a sudden I birdie 17, 18. And it all happened so fast, I couldn't believe walk, or riding back to 18T that I'm in a playoff. And so, you know, one playoff hole, ends and it's over i won and so i think it took me a while that night i went back to my hotel watched super bowl before my red eye and i really just sat there and quiet and just processed how everything just transpired um and it was a great feeling um and then you know being back here um 
a year later, so much has happened, obviously. Um, it was, it's been sad to see what coronavirus has done to the world. Um, a lot of mixed emotions. I've been super proud of the PJ Tour and the fact that we've been able to play and be safe while we're doing it and, you know, give people something to watch on, on TV. Um, and I'm just thankful, thankful to, to have a job. I know so many people right now are, are hurting financially, physically. People have lost loved ones to this disease. And so it's an it's a interesting place of, like, I'm thankful to be here. Uh, but you're also a little bit sad and burdened because, you know, like, we get to go play golf today. A lot of the world's hurting and suffering. So, um, yeah, I'm just I'm, – I'm grateful to be back. And what a great opportunity to try to defend here. Appreciate it. Okay, and we will finish up back with Todd Kelly from the Arizona Republic. Todd, bring it home. Hey, Webb, uh, NBC's debuting a gambling simulcast this week for the first time, one more stage for legalizing sports gambling. Um, can you talk a little bit, what are your thoughts on how this might affect what you do, how the PGA Tour handles its business, stuff like that? Yeah, I, I, I'm not well versed in this area. Um, I've been in conversations with guys where, you know, the only thing we're seems like most guys are worried about is, you know, while we're playing, is there going to be more chatter? before and after shots or before and after made or missed putts, you know, guys out there gambling on us. Um, and hopefully the PGA Tour has a very, you know, strict plan on that kind of, you know, banter from spectators to players. You know, hopefully they'll put a strict plan in place that, you know, we're not going to have kind of the, um, you know, comments from the betters out there you know, during the round. That's obviously something we've never dealt with. Hopefully we won't have to, but that's just one potential problem I see. Okay, thank you. Yep. All right, Webb, we always appreciate your time and certainly wish you the best of luck this week. Thank you. Thanks, Dougie. Appreciate it.